Welcome to the Earth Feels Podcast. I'm Rose. And I'm Christine. Welcome to Earth Feels, the podcast for people feeling overwhelmed by the endlessly gloomy climate news. Where every week we have soul-based conversations about climate change and explore the idea that climate change may be happening for us as much as it is happening to us. If you are ready to shift your focus and secure the future for our kids and our grandkids, then this is the podcast for you. And yes, we do know how to spell. (laughs) Today's topic, what if we work with Mother Nature instead of against her? And we are focused on specifically uh, the question around regenerative agriculture. Correct. Regenerative agriculture. That's hard to say, isn't it? It is. It doesn't, <laughs> doesn't slide off the lips at all. Uh, composting and biochar, which mm. I knew nothing about. So that was pretty fascinating. Okay. And are we still tying this in with uh, the work of Project Drawdown? I think so. Yes. They're okay. still under the, the food chapters of, of Project Drawdown, which is Project Drawdown is the book the most comprehensive plan ever proposed to reverse global warming. And it's edited by Paul Hawken. Yes. So I have to say that of all the solutions, quote unquote, that we've been talking about, that regenerative agriculture really gets me excited. It's okay. I didn't realize how, how much, when I think about carbon going into the atmosphere, I think about the whole fossil fuel thing and how we're burning, we're burning and that's causing, that's causing more carbon and we're flying and we're driving, we're heating our homes, all that kind of stuff. But I didn't think about the fact that every time we dig in the soil, we're releasing carbon that has been sequestered into the soil. Is that, is that true? So just the digging or just, the just the digging, just mm-hmm. the digging. So they're saying that, especially in, in agribusinesses, right. Or they're out there with, with tractors, obviously tractors are spewing too, but they're digging and they're tossing the soil, the soil, the carbon that's sequestered in the soil is being released. So even when you're on your own garden and you're digging a giant hole, they're saying, just dig a smaller hole because, because what's happening is you're, you're interrupting the echo environment that is already in that little, in the soil. So you're just, so so you're disturbing um, microbes and uh, little creepy crawlies and, and their work and their little environment that they are there's a whole nother world that we don't see underneath the soil. We're oblivious to. So why don't uh, we share a definition of regenerative agriculture? I don't have a definition from like Wikipedia or whatever, but uh, what I understand it is there's three different ways of looking at um, what we're doing to the world. Degradation, which is really where we are now. We're destroying the ecosystems. Sustainability, which is what everybody is talking about, right? Um, can we be more sustainable? But sustainable is just the status quo, just saying where we are right now, can we hold that? Or kind of stopping the degradation. Stopping the right? degradation, and, but keeping, but, we're, but we're, where we stop today is where we are. Regenerative is actually, we're making it better. We're make we're adding, we're working with mm. Mother Nature. We're saying, okay, these are your systems. Let's help you along. Let's speed you along. So um, there was somebody that I was reading about earlier who uh, in, do you know about Yes Magazine? Yes, I do. Okay. Know about so yes, Magazine. Yes, Ma- yes Magazine has a whole um, issue dedicated to dirt, beautiful dirt, and the difference between dirt and soil. Um, dirt being lifeless and soil being filled with life. And there was this one gentleman, he's talking about what it takes to create compost 
and um, how how the time it takes to, to create compost is maybe a year. But he has learned that he has learned exactly what the combination of dead and decaying and what they need to be in proportion to each other so that he can speed it up and create soil in three months. So the challenge is, what can we do to help Mother Nature instead of pulling out of her? Well, so my husband, I've mentioned, is an amazing gardener. And uh, oh, you haven't mentioned that he's an amazing gardener. You've just oh, really? said he's a gardener. <laughs> oh no, he he is a, quite an incredible gardener. And so Canada in general is north, but we live in a northern, more northerly part of even the the average uh, Canadian. And so our growing season, if you know about the zones, mm -hmm. uh, are you familiar? I'm not. I'm not sure what Somewhat. your area area would be. Probably eight. Eight. We are yeah. eight. Yeah. Okay, so we're two. We're oh, growing zone two. Yeah. Um, so what that means is you have to be really creative. And luckily, uh, he is. So he grew up in uh, BC in the southern part of BC, which is probably also growing zone eight, or seven, um, and quite a different uh, climate. But I, I'm going to link this to compost. I can talk more about his gardening uh, techniques uh, another time, but he's been experimenting with, with composting. And again, because of where we live, uh, there's not a lot of natural soil. There's lots of rocks and trees and lakes, but not we're in the Canadian Shield. That's rock, basically. So how mm -hmm. to generate good soil that isn't, hasn't been trucked in? We do have, we have paid to have uh, dirt um, dumped in our, our our yard so we could garden but how to do it more sustainably if you want or you know with a lower carbon footprint close to home so he's been experimenting and one summer he got in touch with the local Tim Hortons now if you're not a Canadian it won't uh, mean as much uh, to you but Tim Hortons I don't know if there is Dunkin Donuts a really big donut uh, chain yeah in... Dunks is huge well and then well it would I think Tim Hortons is more like Starbucks almost because it's no. Starbucks is everywhere well, no. so in Canada, Tim Hortons is everywhere and people who are coffee drinkers, which I am not, swear by Timmy's coffee. And of course, because Tim Horton was a hockey player, that is also uh, has a special meaning for Oh, Canadians. I didn't realize so, that. Okay. Yeah, he actually was a real person. So uh, there is a local Tim Hortons chain in town. And uh, my husband, who's called Mark, got in touch with uh, the fellow who runs it and made this proposal that if he got a couple of garbage bins, large garbage bins, and brought them to the Timmy's, that's what we call Tim Hortons here. Every Canadian will know when I say Timmy's what I'm, ta what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, and that if they would fill them with their coffee grounds, and uh, Mark would, whenever they were, they, they were full, Mark would come and pick them up. And wow. Yeah. So for three or four months, that's what that's what happened. At first, this um, fellow was a little bit reluctant because it sounded like more work. But actually, what ended up happening, so Mark, Mark encouraged him a bit and pushed him in and he agreed to it. In the end, when Mark finally is like, that, that's, that's enough, like it was it was fall oh. and it had been uh, a pretty pretty not full-time commitment but twice a week he would have to go and dump these big bins full of coffee waste and filters because they wouldn't take up the coffee filters so uh, and then dump it into the back of our half done drive it home and then shoveled it into our compost and it made number one amazing compost it was compost composting so much uh so quickly that actually it got so hot in the middle of uh the compost pile was ash like that's how wow yeah so coffee if you can get coffee i might have compost, to check the i might have to check the local dunks because yeah. there's about there's at least five of them in falmouth <laughs> yeah amazing if you have a room for a big compost pile it's amazing the second thing that happened when mark uh, told ron who runs the tim hortons here that he just wasn't going to do it anymore Ron said somebody else who, who will do it because number one, their uh, dump fees were hugely mm. decreased because there's so much water 
in that coffee ground waste and they pay by by the pound to mm -hmm. have it taken mm -hmm. away so it was cost saving him a lot of money and number two he'd gotten a green award from the national tim's uh organization for being green oh so, nice yeah, yeah. Nice. so it just goes to show you again that some resistance because it was doing things different and it seemed like it was more work but in the in the end, once he actually tried it, this business person, he's like, this is great. I want more of this. So that was one summer. The second summer, again, uh, on compost and uh, accessing local ingredients. So we, I have said this before, we live in a, a small community where there's a lot of fishing and fishing lodges. And there's uh, just half a kilometer down from us is a, is a fishing lodge. So they have people, a lot of Americans come in from uh, uh, all over Wisconsin. There's Texas license plates. There's Iowa license plates all summer. Any, anyways, they come to our community because the fishing is so good. And they also uh, generate fish waste. Mm, so they're so gutting from, the fish. They're gutting the Yes, and what, what the camp was doing was freezing them in five gallon pails with water and then putting them out on garbage day to actually pay to get them a, a picked up and taken to the dump uh, because there's just too much uh, for them to manage. They couldn't uh, compost it and they, they never even tried. So Mark said to them, well, bring them down half a kilometer, drop them off on my driveway, the frozen pails, and um, I'll deal with deal with the fish waste. And Wow. Yeah, and so he actually... The people I of your town must love Mark. <laughs> well, you know what? There's a lot of really creative people are around here, but Mark is one of them. But, but the whole idea is just changing the thinking uh, about, no, we live in the Canadian Shield, it's just rocks, there's nothing to make soil out of. Actually, besides just kitchen waste, which is a great way to compost, there are resources that are just being untapped. And so he got his hands on an old a wood chipper, mm. and he put mm. the fish through the wood chipper into the, the compost pile, yes, and he would be covered. Yuck. Yep. Yuck. But yuck, again, yuck, yuck. It made amazing compost. So I can I can imagine. So I'm just imagine. telling that story. Share what I think is an interesting story about compost, but also share how we all have uh, a part to play, sort of looking around in our community. What is what is in quotations waste? What is mm -hmm. going to waste that actually we can we can take and be regenerative, like you were talking about, instead of degenerative or even just sustainable not that mm -hmm. there's sustainable is a bad thing but. no sustainable is definitely a step forward and that's really had been my orientation okay what's sustainable what's sustainable mm -hmm. but reading and re regenerative i'm like yeah i mean what can we do to help mother nature just just to lift her up just to make her processes a little bit faster to work with her um and I, and to draw down at the same time, see what we can do to draw out the carbon emissions that we've been spewing. Well, so the, in getting back to the amount of carbon in the soil, that what they were saying, what this article, um, well, in drawdown, what they're talking about under regenerative, and then of course you have to go down the rabbit hole and and Google regenerative and find out what else. But we're losing; we have lost the carbon. 50 to 80% of the carbon that has, that was originally in the soil is gone now. And carbon in the soil actually adds nutrients to our food. So when we're, so in the, these great farmlands, the soil gets depleted because it's being, I think it's, I can't remember the term. It's like, it's a monoculture. So they're planting, for instance, mm -hmm. the same spinach year after year after year, and it just draws all the nutrients that spinach needs out of the soil. And then the, the soil is just, the soil is turned into dirt, which is basic, basically lifeless, lifeless. Mm -hmm. And then those, those acres are basically, they're not useful anymore. And so they just, they're just unused and the farmer goes on or agriculture goes on and they deforest another area and then plant that area and then use that soil until the soil isn't anymore. And what they've been, you know, we can, we can augment it with um, synthetic fertilizers to a certain point, 
but then you're then all that's being uploaded into the roots of the plant and then as you eat it we don't know what the toxic uh what the effect of toxics are on our own human body which we're beginning to right and it also don't don't forget there's a huge issue with agricultural runoff going into the water system Mm -hmm. and into the mississippi like there's a huge dead zone there from toxic agricultural runoff oh Yeah. yeah it becomes it becomes a domino effect right and even for farmers to look at the cost of one of the biggest costs that they have is is fertilizers to um, synthetic fertilizers to to make things grow faster. So how can we do it in cooperation with Mother Nature instead of working against her? Um, planting cover crops, um, using those thousands of acres, hundreds of thousands of acres that are um, actually I think it was like twenty five million acres a year are set aside that are no longer usable. So can we plant trees there? Can we plant? What do we put? What do we put in? What do we plant to bring the carbon back into the soil? And roots of plants bring carbon back into the soil. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of people really knowledgeable on this who are doing exactly that Mm -hmm. around around the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think Drawdown highlights uh, some of those Mm -hmm. projects, does it not? It does. It does. And like I said, there's there's so much out there when you start when you start looking at it. And I'm a gardener. I really hadn't thought about it. I mean, I have been composting for the last few years, not to, not not to the extent not, of Mark. Not excessively. <laughs> Mark's bar Mark's bar is very very high, and I don't. I'm not going to be putting fish in a wood shredder. Um, but <laughs> but um, but the coffee thing is really. I mean, we we do put put um, you know our kitchen waste, and we go out and turn it, and do all do all those kind of good things. But one of the things that I read last just last night was lay the compost on top. Don't mix it in. Mm. Because what happens again, over time with this one particular man, he was talking about that, that sped up and I'll have to link his name, but um, that was speeding up the compost. He found that laying it on top within a year, it was actually the little organisms underneath were all munching it up and were, were, pulling it into the soil and making the soil the, itself. And it wasn't releasing the carbon that you're releasing when you dig it in, because when you mm-hmm. dig it in, you're actually letting what's out there, what's underneath back out there. So it's fair. It's, I thought it was endlessly fascinating. And I'm, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm now so, a true believer. Yeah. So is there one particular resource on regenerative, I still can't say it, regenerative agriculture that we can point our listeners to, or are we going to? Um, I think we'll just list, we'll list a, a bunch. I mean, there's okay. definitely a different. If there isn't one that pops out for you, I know there's the land Institute in Kansas because I have some friends who spent some time there. They're doing that work. And there's a place called, there's a website called kiss the ground.com. Um, and there also is that documentary, the biggest little farm. I, I mm. kind of touched on that um, last time, but it's about a husband and wife team uh, out of LA. They're, they're, they left LA to become far, farmers and they're about 40 miles north of LA. And when they got there, they were like, you know, we're going to just, we're going to farm. And then they found out that, oh, maybe not. And um, so the, it's about, the documentary is very cool and it's about their, learning experience but how they take this kind of barren land and make it and regenerate it mm. and it's it's very inspirational very, i love very that inspirational. and we're going to also put a link to i don't have the video right in front of me but i've uh, seen it a couple of times it's a valley in china that was completely overworked and overused and lifeless and it follows in seven years how following practices that initially the farmers resisted, it Mm -hmm. turned right back into a lush ecosystem. And that's happened in Ethiopia as well. I know of two resources that are amazing with ecosystems that look like they're hopeless, they're dead. All they need is for one thing, for to be stopped, you know, for the, for the degeneration to stop. Mm -hmm. And, and then for some very strategic 
replanting of trees and and doing that can bring back whole water systems that ha have seemed to have disappeared and mm -hmm. they they come back. So it is a beautiful story. And I, I, I'm really happy that we're uh, focusing on, on that because it is, it is a story of hope. And while we're talking about resources, I have two books here in front of me. One is the biochar solution, carbon farming and climate change uh, by Albert Bates. Interestingly, I see the forward is by Vandana Shiva. And that's my next book is soil, not oil by Vandana shiva who's a prominent food act activist uh, in in india um the biochar solution uh is very interesting because it looks at the history of how the indigenous people in the americas particularly south america had this long-held practice of biochar which died out when yeah, europeans I had never yeah who's heard of it who's heard of, who's heard of that well albert bates uh talks uh in quite quite a bit of detail about that i know that drawdown the chapter on biochar touches on it as well they have an archaeolog a picture of an archaeological dig that shows the layers of biochar put there by the indigenous peoples you know 500 years ago uh, but if you want to know more about that and and we haven't really talked much about biochar what it and and what it is so i don't know if we if we should um go into that we've we've uh, sort of defined regenerative agriculture i would say biochar is a, a form of regenerative agriculture um, but it's exciting because it actually again pulls carbon out of the air and sequesters it in the ground we don't mm -hmm. need fancy technology i mean fancy technology is great but it's expensive and it needs to be developed we have this age-old practice that we've just forgotten about that people knew about hundreds of years ago and we just need to start implementing it and the wonderful thing about biochar it, it sequesters carbon but it also in, increases the quality of the soil it, the it fertility it, of yeah, the soil yeah so mm -hmm. exactly it turns it from dirt back to back to soil and there's different ways of making biochar so i don't know if well you and you can actually so in reading the biochar I, chapter i had never heard of it um so biochar is essentially wood that's burned at a very slow rate without oxygen. So it's like burned under the ground. And uh, so you can't do, so you can't just take charcoal and put it in your garden, but, but you can order biochar from Amazon. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. okay, I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to get, well, in, the, in these giant pails or whatever, I'm going to try some and see um, again, you kind of sprinkle it on the top and you let it work its way into the soil. You let the organisms kind of munch it down and um, and bring it into the soil. And again, yeah, makes fertile, lush, growing. Mm -hmm. even, if, even if you're, you know, even if you're just growing perennials or trees or not just, but even if mm -hmm. you know, when you're, when you're growing those kind of things versus food. Right. Can I read a paragraph or two from Albert Bates's book? Yes, I will let you. Okay. And then we have to wrap things up for today. So he says, again, sort of echoing what Rose said, biochar is charcoal, a cellulosic material that has been pyrolyzed, which means fired in a low oxygen environment, such as a kiln, so that everything but the carbon has been burned off. As pure charcoal, it is hard. In Japan, they make xylophone keys from it. Ha! Huh. Yeah, black and largely, largely devoid of any nutrient value. It can produce relatively smokeless heat by being burned further in an oxygen-rich environment, which is why it is valuable for cooking and heating in many parts of the world. A more significant value to our ailing planet is biochar's unique quality as a soil conditioner. Biochar is like a coral reef in the soil. If it is turned into a nutrient pile, and any compost will do, and then tilled into the ground, oh, we'll have to talk about tilling later, but uh, it, it immediately becomes colonized by so soil microbes, 
much in the way coral reefs are populated by all manner of marine life. The microbes attract fungi, which connect to the roots of plants, carrying nutrients from the reef to where they will do the, the most good. Besides stimulating the health of the soil, the biochar provides a reservoir and conduit for soil moisture. So it uh, is a fascinating topic. We can't really do much, uh, give it as much coverage as, as it deserves. Maybe someday we'll have to do one episode just on biochar, um, but it's, it's certainly worth investigating. So I'd recommend the biochar solution by Albert Bates and soil, not oil by Vandana Shiva. And there's one other book that I wanted to talk about. It's called The Soil Will Save Us, and it's Kristen Olson, and she's won some awards for it. Basically, exactly what you were saying before is the technology, yes, we can develop carbon sucking technology, but we don't have that yet. And we're, and we're on the, we're on the clock, tick tock. Um, we have, we can work with mother nature and, and pull the carbon in, back into the soil and, and help the, the areas that are, where, where the soil is completely cracked from drought and, we can we can make a difference in those kinds of things. At the same time, when we're when we're degrading the soil, we're also um, eliminating agriculture. The, the possibility of agriculture to feed the seven point seven billion people that we now have on the planet. So it's working hand in hand, and I just I find the whole thing just really really exciting. Well, that sounds like a wonderful way to close this discussion, at least uh, for now. There's exciting solutions out there. Yeah, there are. There are. There yeah. are. And everyone who has a yard, whether you own or rent or whatever, or, you're, or you have a, um, a community garden, a plot at a community garden, these are things that you can do to make a difference. Composting. Composting. Possibly not making biochar yet. Not yet. Not unless you have a kiln, <laughs> but if you're a potter, maybe if you have a kiln, I don't know. So what's our good news for this week? Rose? Well, good news for this week. I really wanted to just give a shout out to Greta and the 4 million young people who showed up worldwide to make a statement that we need a new direction. I participated in Boston's, uh, climate strike on Friday. And there were about 8,000 people there, mostly young people. Um, I was standing underneath a speaker so that I could hear the people on stage. And, and um, they were all young people under the age of 18 that got up there with such presence and talked about their story and why, what got them to the point that they wanted to make a difference. But sitting on the speaker next to me were a brother and sister, 11 and 14 years old. And I thought, you know, this is what it's about. These kids get it. There were a lot of elders too, a lot of people that are retirement age that have more time to do it. Not a lot of people in between. Um, but it was a great beginning. And, um, and kudos to Greta, because a year ago, she was sitting in front of the Swedish parliament by herself. And there's, there's a meme, I, I, maybe we can share that. There's, yes, there's yes. a meme with her, the picture of her by herself. And then one year later, yeah. the movement that she started. So don't ever believe that one person can't make a difference, because yeah. she certainly has. And I would say she didn't start it, but she gave it momentum. There are people who've been, you know, working and young people working on climate. Oh, issues, undoubtedly. But she gave it momentum. The momentum that she's created is, is so amazingly awesome. So yes, mm -hmm. big, I, I love that um, good news because it, it, it is. And let's share, I'd like to also include the five minute speech she gave to the UN yesterday which mm, uh mm, was mm -hmm. so, how dare you yeah, yeah how dare you exactly how dare you so we'll share that and yeah, that gives me goosebumps Oof. yeah and our action uh, step this week is related to our topic right the action step for this week i would say just google regenerative agriculture because i got so excited about it i hope that you will too yeah you can google it and also try to say it three times in a row without <laughs> 
<laughs> Three times fast. Yes. Okay. So that's, that's great to do some education on regenerative agriculture. I still can't say it properly. And the self-care uh, tip for this week, it will be thanks to Eckhart Tolle, who's always reminding us to be present, that uh, a present moment reminder is be aware of your breathing. Notice how this takes attention away from your thinking and creates space. So a simple step, just oh, as I read that, I feel like taking mm. a deep breath and just uh, relaxing my body a bit. So thank you for listening, everyone. Have a wonderful week and uh, we'll catch you next, next time. week. That's this week's episode of Earth Feels. Special thanks to singer-songwriter Kristen Hoffman for generously allowing us to use song for the ocean. Thanks for listening. Don't forget, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes or Google Play so you don't miss an episode. Catch you next time. Bye-bye. Children of the earth, I'm calling out. There's a mission for you and for me. She has been suffering And the truth is told beneath the sea